chapter 24, verses 36 through 48. <clears throat> Excuse me. Please hear now these words. While they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified, and they thought they were seeing a ghost. And he said to them, Why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. I beg your pardon. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, have you anything to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and he ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. This is the word of God for the people of God today. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Come Holy Spirit, come. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So when Mike and I first got married, we were at best casual church attenders. I think we both felt like we should go, but the truth is, I didn't really want to go to church. Although I had been raised in a Christian home and had wonderful Christian parents, I have to admit that I struggled with great doubt. I wanted to have faith. I'd seen faith in action. I had experienced things that others called miracles, yet the rational side of my brain kept saying, wait a minute. You really think that happened? Come on, it's impossible. Going to church every once in a while, well, I would leave empty pretty much every time. Was it all just smoke and mirrors? I wasn't sure, really. My doubts seemed to cover cover both sides, uh, either yes or no. And so I drifted. That is until Mike's job moved us to a small town in central Texas. And after closing on our first home, we set out one afternoon on a walk around our new neighborhood. And as we were walking, we were greeted by a man working in his front yard. And we exchanged pleasantries with him, and then he invited us in to meet his wife and have a drink with them on their back patio. Well, we had a wonderful time with this couple, Wayne and Mary Lou Walther. And uh, being new to the area and not knowing anyone, well, we were just glad to have a chance to make new friends. And so drinks soon came into an impromptu dinner. And as we were leaving, saying our goodbyes right at the door, the man, Wayne, turned to us and said, <clears throat> so glad you guys came over. By the way, I'm the pastor at a church here in town, and I'd love it if you guys would come on Sunday. Well, as we walked down the street, I turned to Mike and I said, I knew there had to be a catch. (laughs) It was too good to be true. Well, the next Sunday came and we did not go visit the church. But the following weekend on Saturday, we were out in our yard and we were working and we had zero plants and trees because it was a new house. We had bought a tree, though, and we were trying to plant it. We were having some difficulty when Wayne pulled up in his pickup truck. He said, hey, good morning. I saw you were out here planting and I wondered if you needed any help. He said, actually, I used to own a nursery and so I have about 10 saplings that I'd love to help you plant if you'd like. What could we say? We couldn't say no. 
So we gladly accepted his help, and he spent pretty much the rest of the day with us planting seven good-sized trees in our yard. Now, as we were thanking him profusely as he got ready to leave, he said, no thanks, uh, no, no need to thank me, really. I was happy to help. But by the way, no pressure on visiting, but we sure would love to see you on Sunday morning. <laughs> So after he left, I turned to Mike and I said, well, I guess we kind of have to go visit now. I mean, he's just so nice and he was so kind. Uh, I mean, he pretty much gave up his whole Saturday for us. It's pretty much the least we can do. We've got to go. So the next day we got up, we got our then two children ready and headed to visit Grace Lutheran Church in Lockhart, Texas. Now I was already feeling uncomfortable but that discomfort really increased as the service went on because everything was new to us. It was, it was pretty much high liturgy and we had no idea where we were, what we were supposed to be doing. So we stood there awkwardly kind of looking around until this older woman sidled up to me and passed me a hymnal, pointed out where we were. And then every time something changed, she would show us where we were in the service. Now, at the end of the service, I turned to thank her, and Mike and I, still kind of feeling a little bit out of our depths, were trying to gather our kids together so we could get out of there as soon as possible. And this woman says, I'm so glad you came this morning. My name is Annabelle Hunky, and I'm just thrilled to meet you. And as she's talking to me, uh, she's waving, Arthur, Arthur, get over here and meet these really nice people. So we stood there while Arthur came over. And Annabelle said, hey, you have to come to our house for lunch. God must have known you were coming because we made a ham, and there is no way Arthur and I can eat a whole ham by ourselves. So, please come. Well, we stood there, okay. <laughs> we felt like we couldn't refuse after her kindness to us, and so we made our way to the door to go to the Hunkies for a meal. And as we got there, well, Wayne was standing there, and he said, I'm really glad you were here this morning. I know the way we Lutherans do things is a bit different than what you're used to, but I'm so glad. If you have any questions, just come ask me. Let's talk. And he said, by the way, I forgot to mention this the other day. We have formed a new neighborhood book group. We'd like to invite you to join. We have, uh, right now, we have one of the lawyers and his wife in town, and we have the principal and his wife and the vice principal and his wife, and went on and on, told us all the people that were in it, and he says, oh, we'd really like you to join. We read fiction and nonfiction. It should be a really good time. Now, I gotta tell you, I love to read, and those of you who know me know I love social gatherings, so it was a no-brainer for me. I was like, yep, we're in, we are in. Now, I gotta tell you that it was only later that I would realize how pivotal that day, that wonderful, somewhat awkward day was in my life. It was a day when the, my perspective on things began to change. A day that led to the rediscovering of my faith and a day that eventually led me to stand here before you today as a pastor. Our scripture lesson for today is one that describes a day that many of the disciples would probably call a pivotal day. It was a day that changed their perspective in many ways on pretty much everything in their lives. And it begins with the words, while they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said, peace be with you. Now, it's kind of confusing, isn't it? Because who is they and what were they talking about? If we look at the previous verses, we see that they are the 11 disciples and their companions who were just informed by Cleopas and another follower of Jesus that they had met Jesus on the road to a village called Emmaus and had broken bread with him. So they're coming to tell these, the disciples, the 11 and their companions, and as they're discussing it, Luke tells us that Jesus appears in their midst and says, peace be with you. 
Now, the Greek word here is irene, which means peace, but it means a little bit more than peace. It means peace amid chaos. I love that. Peace amid chaos. Peace amid your chaos, Jesus says. Peace amid the chaos of your lives right now. Peace amid the chaos of your minds right now. Peace be with you. Now we're told that the disciples and those with them are startled and terrified because they think they've seen a ghost. And Jesus says to them, why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your heart? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see for a ghost doesn't have flesh and bones as you see that I have. When he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And here is where it gets really interesting. Because Jesus has just appeared, shown them, shown them the holes in his hands and his feet. They have to know it's him. But Luke tells us that in their joy, their joy over seeing the one they thought was dead, their leader, their Messiah, the one they acknowledged as the son of God, in their joy, we are told they were disbelieving and still wondering now, last week we talked about disbelief as, as in I will believe only if kind of bargaining with God kind of faith. But that's not the disbelief we're talking about right here. This is what we would call doubt. They saw his wounds. They saw his face. They, they heard his voice. But they were still skeptical. They are eyewitnesses to the resurrection of Jesus, yet they can't quite bring themselves to believe it. Despite everything, they're still wondering if it's true. It's pretty easy for us to shake our heads here and wonder what's wrong with these people. I mean, the dare, I dare say that the, the sentiment of these disciples is one that we're all pretty familiar with. However, right? Because it doesn't really matter who you are. I'm certain that you have had, you have now, or you will have at some point in your faith walk, doubt. And I got to tell you, likely more than once or twice. So it's a little disconcerting when we hear Jesus say, as some will say, uh, rebuking his disciples, why do doubts arise in your hearts? Why do doubts arise in your hearts? Well, because, we want to say, I mean, God gave us this great brain, this great capacity for rational thinking, and the fact is that the resurrection is beyond all rational thinking, isn't it? The concept of a loving God, one who sent his son into the world to show us how much we are loved, well, that's pretty much beyond rational thinking too, isn't it? The coming of the Holy Spirit, I mean, or even the incarnation or the ascension, all of that, well, it's all beyond rational thinking. And we're rational people. We were made that way by the God who created us. You see, we experience God, yeah, we might be profoundly changed, but even that's completely irrational. That's why doubts arise in our hearts, Jesus, that's why. This question seems to imply that doubts are bad and it leaves many of us kind of feeling guilty. Guilty about having doubts and Afraid to admit them, ashamed of them, so much so that we bury them. Doubt is wrong, what we think. Doubt is the enemy of faith. Believe, we are told. Ours is not to reason why, just believe. The thing is, you see, we see this passage and tend to read Jesus' words in our cultural context. So we hear an exasperation in his voice. Why do doubts arise in your hearts? Why are you so hard-headed? What's wrong with you? Why is your faith so weak? But if we look at this in the original Greek, what Jesus says is something more like this. Why do you let confused, self-based reasoning fill your mind? 
In other words, why do you let these thoughts rule your life? In Jan Martel's book, Life of Pi, which many of you know is one of my favorite books of all times, the leading character, uh, a young boy named Pi, speaks about his doubt. He openly expresses his skepticism that comes from reasoning and his scientific understanding of life. But he says this, to choose doubt as a philosophy of life is akin to choosing immobility as a mean of means of transportation. To choose doubt as a philosophy of life is akin to choosing immobility as a means of transportation. I love that. You see, that's what Jesus is saying here. There's no shame in doubt. Ask questions, seek answers, but don't just sit in a room ruminating about it. See, doubt is not the enemy of faith. Doing nothing is the enemy of faith. You will doubt. You will doubt. Even if you have seen, you will doubt. Because you see, faith without doubt is not really faith. If you know with certainty that something is true, well, faith is superfluous, right? As pastor and author David Luce says, faith is not knowledge. It is trust in spite of the lack of evidence. Faith is acting as if something is true even when you have no proof that it is. See, the disciples are all in this room going back and forth over the resurrection. Did he or didn't he rise? I don't know. Was it really him or was it someone just pretending to be him? I don't know. How do we know? Well, if we can't prove that it was him, well, maybe people won't listen. But if we can prove that it is him, well, maybe they will listen. I don't know. What if they prove us wrong? Then we're going to look like complete fools. I don't know. Peter, what do you think? Well, I'm not sure. It kind of sounded like him. But what do you think, John? Well, I agree it could have been him. But really, what are the odds? I mean, what do you think, James? Well, if he did rise, I mean, what does it really mean? We're still under Roman control. And if we come out saying we believe, well, they're likely going to kill us. So there's that. What do you think, Andrew? And then Jesus appears and says, Peace to you amid the chaos. Peace to you amid the chaos. And we all jump back because they, what the heck? <laughs> Where'd this guy come from? How'd he get in? Is it Jesus? Maybe. Can't be. I mean, sounds like him, but can't be. Must be a ghost. They're terrified. They see him, they, they hear him, they even see his wounds, but their doubts keep them from recognizing him. Hey, listen, Jesus says, it's me. It's me. And do you remember what I told you? Do you remember I told you this was going to happen? Do you remember I told you I was going to rise? Do you remember that the good news, metanoia, transformation, and forgiveness... Freedom from the things that drag you down, the, the sins that keep you li from living a full life, all of that is supposed to be proclaimed in my name to all the nations. You are witnesses to this, so go, do. Love in my name so that all will know. Ask questions, sure, seek answers, sure, pray, yes, talk with others, but don't stop there. Go. And the disciples did. It was a pivotal day for them. A day that changed their perspective on pretty much everything. Not because they saw Jesus and knew with certainty that he was indeed resurrected. But because despite their uncertainty, they chose to go. They chose to do. And their faith grew in the doing. My friends, that's a profound lesson for all of us doubters out there. You see, faith doesn't grow by seeing. Because in spite of the old adage, seeing is not believing. The truth is, believing is seeing. 
It's a lesson I learned many years ago in that small town in Central Texas. After eating with Arthur, Bell, uh, Arthur and Annabelle, we made the decision to go back to church the next Sunday, and the Sunday after that, and the Sunday after that. We joined the neighborhood book group. We met with Wayne and joined the Sunday school class at the church, a place where honest questions were not only welcome but also discussed. Pretty soon I was doing Meals on Wheels and a variety of other things in the community. And slowly but surely I noticed something. My faith began to grow. My faith began to grow because in my doing, you see, my eyes were open to see things in a different light. Through a different lens. The lens of faith. And with that lens, I began to both see and experience the power of the resurrection firsthand. See, I don't believe because I have seen the resurrected Jesus personally. I believe because I have met the risen Christ in and through the people of a small town in central Texas. People who cared enough to include me in their circle People who lifted me when I was down, who comforted me when I was grieving, who celebrated with me when good came. And they prayed earnestly with me when I needed it most. I believe because, you see, I've experienced the power of resurrection in my life, and I have witnessed it in the lives of others. I believe because I experienced Christ here in this place, in each of you, I believe because I am a witness, a witness to the difference that Jesus makes in the life, in, of my life and the life of others. I believe because I've experienced the difference that love makes in this world. And I believe because through my faith, I have found the deep joy of serving Jesus. Do I still doubt? Absolutely. I ask questions. I look for answers, but I have learned that faith is not made up of answers. Faith is made up of a lot of questions. And it's looking to the one whom we put our whole trust in. Trusting that what he says is true. And that what God did through him God can do through us. That's why we, why we, in our doubt, must continue to go, must continue to do. You will experience faith once you step out in faith. I'd like to say to you all, if you have questions, great doubts that you would like to have addressed at some point, will you please write it on a piece of paper? You can put it in the offering plate, you can put it in the, um, the little uh, plastic thing by the front office door, and I'll get them out and look at them. You don't have to sign your name, you can be anonymous. But I'd like to be able for us all to talk about doubt in a realistic and, and helpful way, not shove it down and pretend it doesn't exist. Because I guarantee you, doubt can help your faith grow if we address it and we look at it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.